My name is John Cumbers. I'm the founder and the CEO of Symbio Beta. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. We have some amazing panelists for you today on pandemic preparedness, talking all about sequencing and searching for antibodies. We'd love to know where you are dialing in from today. So if you want to type it into the chat box below and uh, say hi to everybody else, then we would like to uh, kick off in just a few minutes. I see that we have Yvonne Linney. Welcome, Yvonne. Good to, good to see you here. And uh, I'm very shortly going to be welcoming all of our panelists to join me as well. Uh, the first panelist today is uh, Dr. Eric Hobbs, who is the CEO of Berkeley Lights. And today we have a sponsorship by Berkeley Lights of today's Symbio Beta Live. So it's great to, uh, to have Eric join us. Um, we also have uh, Narendra Mareshri, who is the head of the Mammalian Foundry at Ginkgo Bioworks. Very exciting to see uh, Ginkgo doing so many interesting things in um, in the area of COVID-19. And we also have Erica Ullman Sapphire, who is a structural biologist at La Jolla University. So welcome, uh, Erica, as well. And we have uh, we have Anyang, who is uh, a uh, a biologist at. Um, at Johns Hopkins University, Anhyang Li, and uh, she's going to be joining us as well. We're also going to be joined by Jim Crow, who is at Vanderbilt Vaccine Center. Jim is now a regular of Symbiobeta, uh, Symbiobeta Lives, and we're going to be getting an update on uh, on that project as well. So let me just welcome uh, Eric Hobbs. Hi, Eric. How are you? Thanks for joining us today. Doing well, John. Thanks for having us all on the show today. Absolutely, I'm excited, and uh, and as usual, you're joined by your uh, your luminescent bio pens in the background. This is the Berkeley Lights uh, system. If you haven't uh, if you haven't tried it, uh, then uh, I highly recommend it. And we're actually going to be doing a deep dive on the beacon in a couple of weeks' time, where we actually get down and dirty and roll up our sleeves and see uh, see how it all works. I see a lot of people joining us. Natalie Caldell from uh, from Boston. Hi, Natalie. Welcome, Jonathan Burbaum from uh, San Francisco. Welcome. So if you want to say where you're dialing in from, you can just type it into the box below. And uh, we hope that you like this new platform. It's a little bit of a barrier to entry than Zoom, but we hope that you find it more interactive and the ability to chat more with each other. One of the main features of this platform is the breakout groups. And it's called Hop In because you can hop in and out of different groups. And so in, half an, uh, in an hour at 9 AM Pacific, we're going to be having a series of breakout groups and uh, some of the speakers can stay and they can go deeper on some of the topics that we bring up in this next hour's discussion. I see we have uh, Jim Crow who's joined us from Vanderbilt Vaccine Center. Jim, welcome, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely, we appreciate and we know how busy you are dealing with this pandemic. So we really appreciate having an hour of your time to, to come and give us an update and talk about how we can prevent all of this from happening again. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks again for joining us. And I know there was a big storm last night, so we're even lucky that we've got uh, we've got internet and you drove into the office to speak with us today. So I appreciate yeah. that even more. Yeah. yeah, we had a big storm and all the power's out in the city. So uh, <laughs> I'm at the medical center, which has restored power. So I guess we're okay for the moment. Yeah, we're just waiting for the plagues of locusts and the earthquakes to hit. Exactly. Well, the plagues of locusts are already in Africa. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, this is happening. <laughs> well, great. Well, we'll uh, well, it began in Africa, and and we'll uh, we'll start in Africa in a second because I watched your tech talk last night, uh, Jim, and it was uh, it was quite emotional to uh, to see that. So I I, I want to start there because I think it really hammers home uh, why we're doing this and why we're all together today. Uh, but before we do that, I, I see we have an international audience uh, dialing in today. I see we have Vijay Shankar from Marburg in Germany and uh, Chris Wells from the University of Edinburgh in the UK and uh, and a whole lot of other people dialing in, uh, somebody else from Germany. So welcome everybody. Excellent to see uh, this global audience. And um, if we can also just have the Symbi Beta folks just direct traffic, uh, we've got a few people who are lost in some of the breakout rooms, and we can make sure that they're here uh, in the main session. I see we've still got uh, we've still got people joining. So if you're just joining us today, this is a fantastic day to be working on antibodies, to be sequencing blood, and to be finding uh, COVID-19 antibodies that are going to neutralize the virus. But it's also a day to be thinking towards the future and trying to prevent these global pandemics from happening again. And that's what the GPAD consortium is all about. And we're going to be talking with the CEO of Berkeley Lights is and why it was started. We're also joined by Narendra Hamesh Maheshri. Did I pronounce that correctly, Narendra? 
Maheshri, I apologize, uh, who is the head of the Ginkgo uh, Foundry, the mammalian foundry at Ginkgo Bioworks in Boston. And if you haven't been keeping up with what Ginkgo has been doing, they've committed $25 million of time on their foundry for COVID-19 projects. So a lot of exciting work coming out of Ginkgo. Um, we also have Fire, and Erica Sapphire is a biologist, a structural biologist. And uh, Erica is at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology, and we're going to be talking a lot about uh, there. And I see you are also in Marburg, so maybe that's the Marburg connection that we have uh, dialing in, uh, Erica, some of, your, uh, some of your fans. And we have uh, Yan Hyung uh, Lee, who is uh, at... At Emory. Uh, Emory. Emory. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. I keep having to flick through my <laughs> notes. Uh, Yang Hyung. Oh, you're at Emory. I'm sorry. You, you were previously at Johns Hopkins, so thank you for that, Yang Hyung. Um, so uh, I think we're going to get uh, get started now. And uh, so, Jim, I wanted to jump over. If you could just tell us a little bit about your time in Africa, because what, what were you doing there? What did you see? And what was the, the, you know, the pivotal point in your career that then shifted you over towards looking at these uh, these horrible infectious diseases like uh, like COVID-19? Well, I'm an, an MD, I guess, in the research world. They call it just an MD, uh, JMD. <laughs> Uh, and I trained as a pediatrician and infectious disease expert. Uh, but at the time, uh, when I was working in Africa, I went to Papua New Guinea in the Pacific and West Africa and East Africa. And I was looking for a place to spend my life uh, on the ground in a, in a lower resource area. And um, really, when you're in those areas, there's just a few things that kill people. Infectious diseases is a big part of that. Prematurity is another, but infectious diseases is one of the dominant causes of disease and mortality. And if you're there and uh, you're just present and paying attention to what's going on, there's no way that you cannot be moved by uh, the inequity of access to healthcare uh, in places around the world. Uh, not, not only in Africa, but it's very, uh, it's very stark in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the inequities of healthcare. So I wanted to do something about that and having experienced being with the people and their aspirations for their family. I want to do something with my career to make a solution. And if you work day to day in, uh, in a, like a clinic or a hospital where I was in East Africa, you can see maybe 80 or 100 people a day if you work really hard. Uh, but the promise of technologies like vaccines and antibodies are that they can eradicate diseases or modify diseases for millions of people. So that's what I caught uh, um, a vision for not just cranking through 100 people a day, uh, but doing something that would intercept the disease ahead of time uh, and affect millions of people. So that's how I got into this, uh, this line of work. Great. And Erica, you were also in Africa. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing there and the work that you've done in Ebola? Sure. We've been working in West Africa on Lassa virus and in Congo on Ebola and related viruses. So I've spent my career looking at the molecular structures of the pieces that build these viruses and drive them into cells. And while we've been crafting versions of these molecules that beautifully represent the right antibody epitopes, we wanted to use them for practical purpose. So we've done two things. We've used them for serology to go looking for evidence of circulation of these viruses where there hasn't been an outbreak. It looks like there's more than we know. And we've also used them to go and try to find for Lassa virus, are there neutralizing antibodies in survivors and why haven't they been found yet? And can we tease them out? And once we find them, that becomes a first in class antibody therapy for a disease that has no other. I don't know too much about uh, Velocivirus and I don't know too much about Ebola. Can you just help us quickly understand the difference? Everybody now knows everything about the uh, uh, viruses, which is fantastic, a flourishing of, of education around the immune system of viruses. But just give us a quick 101 on those two viruses and how they differ from, uh, from our good old friend, the coronavirus. Sure. Ebola virus causes hemorrhage, fever, diarrhea. It could be 40 to 90% lethal depending on the outbreak and depending on the location, the strain, the species of the virus. Thankfully, it's rare. It pops up. People don't travel real far once they have Ebola. Eventually, it burns out. In 2014, it got up to 30,000 cases. There's a, been one that's been simmering in eastern Congo for a few years now. Lhasa also causes a hemorrhagic fever. Lethality is poorly understood. It's been thought to be 1% to 10%, but diagnosis was based on symptomology alone. Once modern diagnostics were available, cases that presented to clinic were 50 to 70% lethal. So that selects for people that are sick enough to go to clinic, clearly. 
but it can be 90% lethal in pregnant women, and there is no vaccine, there are no antivirals, and it's endemic, it's bred by rodents, and those rodents are ubiquitous in human habitations, in farmlands, and so it would be very difficult to ever get rid of that. Vaccines and treatments are really badly needed. And uh, and and physically, uh, these look like coronaviruses. Are they are they round balls with uh, with uh, you know things like spike proteins on the outside? The Lassa virus is it's a little round guy, uh, pleomorphic, adopts different shapes. A bola virus is a long filamentous particle, sort of like that. <laughs> Looks like a strand of spaghetti that adopts whatever shape it falls onto the EM grid on, and they're long. They're in micron long. Oh wow! Okay. Great. Um, Eric, I want to bring you into the conversation. Can talk a little bit about Berkeley Lights and we'll talk about the GPAT consortium and why you started it. But uh, Berkeley Lights is quite a magical piece of uh, piece of equipment for being able to do digital cell biology and, and move cells ar around and manipulate them and do so all sorts of experiments. Was the was the beacon that the, the piece of technology that you designed, was it designed for hunting for antibodies in, in, in plasma or, or give, give us a sense of where the company came from and then we'll, then we'll dive into uh, this consortium. Yeah, certainly, John. Uh, the Berkeley, Berkeley Lights is, a, as you mentioned, the leading digital cell biology company and, and really our focus is to accelerate the commercialization of biotherapeutics. That's kind of where we started and, and through that process, you know, we started with, you know, processing humanized transgenic mice or immunized animals. Um, and so what our platform does is we import live biology into the system and we place the cells, we use uh, optoelectronics, uh, optoelectronic positioning to move these cells clonally into these small little nanopens that you see behind me. And once the cells are in those nanopens, uh, you know, and, and in particular when you have plasma-based B cells, which Onion can bring you up to speed on, on that as we move forward, um, these cells are secreting. And if they're not plasma cells, uh, you know, there are magical uh, materials and medias uh, that come from people like Onion and Emery, where you can actually, uh, uh, you know, differentiate these cells to, to start to secrete like plasma cells. And as these cells are secreting the antibodies, you can test those antibodies. You can run different tests, you can run binding, uh, you can run blocking assays, we've even run, we've even run functional neutralizing antibodies with different, with different uh, 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 VSV kind of uh, constructs inside of uh, the Berkeley system so that you can see that these cells are functional. And, and so after about 10 hours of running our automated workflow, you can start to export the leading candidates for downstream processing. And um, you know we've been we've been doing this uh, since uh, we've that's that's one of the the major workflows that Berkeley Lights offers. Now since the COVID nineteen outbreak, we've really been working with uh, multiple both commercial and, and academic institutions to enable them with our technology to find antibodies. Um, and so whether it was GenScript. Uh, in China, where eight immunized animals were police escorted to the nearest Berkeley Lights Beacon, or uh, with with uh, Professor Jim Crow and Anyang uh, here on on you know Professor Anyang uh, uh, Lee from Emory, um, where we we found over 500 antibody therapeutic candidates uh, in in a, from a recovering patient's blood, uh, or or as we just recently announced our work with uh, we we collaborated with Larry Green of Alexis and Alivamab Discovery Services to find additional uh, functional antibody therapeutic candidates from an immunized uh, transgenic animal. Um, and we'll continue to, to run these discovery campaigns until we, we see uh, you know, uh, an FDA approved therapy. Uh, I know we have an emergency use right now uh, with Gilead, but, but we really need to continue to push forward because it, not all of these antibody therapeutic candidates will become uh, will become in the end a, ther a therapeutic, and so that's that's a, a, a high level background of, of Berkeley Lights, our platform, and where, where we've been applying it in this particular uh, pandemic. Great, thank you, Eric. And as I said, we'll come back to the GPAD consortium and what it is in a second. Um, uh, Yan Yang uh, Lee, could you just give me a, a sense of what you've been working on when you first started to work with? coronavirus specifically, and then uh, these patients that you've been sequencing. And can you give us kind of a timeline of events and then help us understand where things are at right now? Sure. 
So um, our lab focuses on understanding how um, long-lived plasma cells are formed. So one of the problems that we have with coronaviruses is that do they really form long-lived immunity? So one of the questions we want to understand is how do you form that? So that's basically the, the workings or the expertise that we bring to the table. But in terms of what Eric was describing about Berkeley Likes, their system is phenomenal because of the ability to select individual functional cells. So I think they say they can see function of a cell in real time. And so one of the problems that we've always had in basically identifying the plasma cells that make the right antibody for the targets that you want is that it's like one in a million or one in a hundred thousand or one in 10,000. And if you can't find the, you can make 10,000 antibodies, but they're not going to be very good. And it's very, very cumbersome and it takes forever and we'll never get an antibody in time for us to have a good therapeutic. But if we can select up front one in a thousand, one in 10,000, or one in a million from a person who's recovered, meaning from their memory B cells, and then we differentiate them further into a plasma cell and we can isolate the specific target of the neutralizing one we want, or we could even go into the bone marrow of cells where long-lived plasma cells reside after people have recovered. And now the frequency is gonna be much, much less, like one in 10,000, one in 100,000. How do we select the right candidate? And so using berkeley Light system, we said when we saw that we create the specialized media that allows us to keep these cells alive in culture, we said, that's the best application. But we weren't the engineers in terms of making this happen on a single cell basis. So when I had seen Berkeley Lights, um, their technology, I said, this is fantastic. This is exactly what you want to use it for. And of course, they were doing it already. We just basically enabled them to do it better. We enabled them to make it happen faster. And then we were able to work with Jim for the coronaviruses to make this a reality. So I think that's the exciting part of it that we helped. That's all we did. But we're so excited because I think it's going to really make a difference very quickly. And that's the key piece. Great. Um, so help me understand. So you've been, you did the, you had the patient samples in Emory and then you passed, you found the, uh, the, the, the B cells and then you passed them to, to Jim at Vanderbilt. Is that right? No, we just actually provided them the media. I'm not going to take any credit for anything we didn't do, but we can do the same thing. We can take marrow cells, we can take B cells and differentiate them. But I think Jim had gotten them from other collaborators up in Seattle um, and they shipped them down. And he, he, I mean, Jim is an expert in terms of making monoclonal antibodies from memory B cells and he has a beautiful system of differentiating them. But people will get a little longer and actually select the ones that you want. And that's what we helped with. We just, we enabled this process possible, I guess. And I, they can attest to how helpful it was for them. But I think that that's what we did. Great. Uh, Jim, can I bring you in here to, to comment on this? Sure. Well, um, we've been working for 20 years to try to make human monoclonals from human B cells. And I think uh, it used to be impossible. I'd say two decades ago, it was amazing if you got a single monoclonal out of a sample that bound the thing to which you were interested. Uh, but over time, the improvements in, in the technologies have become logarithmically better. Uh, and even three years ago, people were still dealing with bulk sets of cells, but with the whole single cell revolution with RNA-seq and single cell biology, people increasingly have the expectation that we will deal with single cells, not with bulk cells. And I think that's where the Berkeley Lice instrument comes in. Uh, and it, in fact, it's not the only single cell biology instrument. Uh, there are other ways to put a single cell in a vesicle or something like that. But what we found compelling about it is you can actually see what's going on. You can visualize a single cell. You know it's not two cells. Uh, and as the, uh, the cell is secreting antibody, you can essentially visualize the antibody uh, pouring out of the little pen and binding to the antigen. So that visual, uh, validation of what's going on rather than a blind system with lots of little vesicles in a tube gives you a lot of confidence in what's going on. Uh, and, and it's just very compelling that uh, you can do a pre-enrichment uh, the old ways with antigen using flow cytometry or stimulation or all sorts of things. Once the, you're on the instrument, you know which ones are specific and you export them. So I think um, you know, this revolution has been building and is in a logarithmic phase and, and this technology just takes us a whole other level. So 
Um, and then one of the challenges is cells don't like being alone. A single cell in a, in a tube or plastic is not happy. And uh, that's where the media that Union's been developing really comes into play. Because if the cells are not happy, they won't make the antibody. If they don't make the antibody, you can't detect them. So, so this combination of instrument and protocols and media have all sort of come together like in like a cord, you know, threads that have come into a really strong cord. So I think it's just serendipitous that all of a sudden all these things came together in the moment of coronavirus and, you know, we were able to deploy all of it together, this whole history of technology and, and media and protocol development all at once. And I remember when I first saw the the Berkeley lights, and I knew about the company for a couple of years, and then and then uh, Troy Leinberger, who's a colleague of Eric's at Berkeley Lights, said, "No, you've got to come in to the lab, and you've got to see this in action." So I was like, "Okay, I'll come into the lab and see it in action." I mean, it was it's everything I ever dreamed of from 15 years ago in grad school, when you're you're learning all this theoretical stuff about biology and how cells work and and what they look like, and you maybe look at something under a glass microscope slide and, uh, on a microscope, and then you see this thing in action, and it's just the most magical moment for any biological engineer who's dreamt of, of having control and, and engineering ability over biology. Um, it, it really kind of just lays it out for you, so it, it's it's quite remarkable. Uh, I want to bring you in, Narendra, and I, I know that you have to leave us in 20 minutes because because uh, you have another uh, commitment. But I appreciate you joining us from from Ginkgo Bioworks and Berkeley Lights. Now, uh, sorry, Ginkgo Bioworks. You you are using Berkeley Lights. You have two beacons in your foundry at Ginkgo, at, but you're also a professor at, at MIT before you joined Ginkgo. So can you give us a sense of of uh, maybe what you were doing at MIT, what you were now doing at Ginkgo, and then what, what if you had the same reaction as I did when you when you first saw what the uh, what the Berkeley Lights machine can do? Um, yeah, well, so when I was at MIT, I, I thought a lot about um, variability in single cells that were genetically identical, and and sort of what was the cause for that variability? Um, was it the fact that Reactions are inherently stochastic, random. Was that reason giving rise to why one cell was, you know, doing one thing, the other cell was doing something else? Uh, we we did a lot of microscopy um, to look at single cells as as they were growing or in, and seeing what their behavior was. Uh, so then th that was a previous life. Then I, I came to Ginkgo and thought a lot about technology and how we can take uh, use technology to essentially make biology easier to engineer. Um, uh, help building a platform to, to do that engineering. And uh, a few years ago now, uh, got to sort of see the beacon. I actually uh, uh, met Troy in Emeryville, uh, as you, you were talking about Troy Leenberger, that's uh, Eric's colleague, and uh, got to see this device in action. And man, if, if I had a beacon uh, back when I was at MIT to look at the variability in, in single cell, you know, I could just imagine uh, thousands of different um, uh, experiments to do. So uh, what, what's interesting, you know, for us, uh, Ginkgo has historically been working with microbes, right, not mammalian. And uh, uh, Eric and, and folks at Berkeley Lights have been, you know, really using the beacon for uh, uh, challenges with uh, animal free, uh, cell line development, functional T cell analytics, all, all sorts of mammalian stuff. Uh, so we, we looked at that and thought, gosh, can we unlock its potential for microbes? Microbes also, right? Uh, we, we're looking for microbes that produce more of something, for example, or, or maybe for the genetic engineering of microbes, uh, where you really only need to change one particular cell. And so that's what we, you know, we've been doing that with them. You know, we have a multi-year, um, uh, multi-million dollar type of uh, collaboration with, with these guys, um, two beacons, uh, two folks from Berkeley Lights at Ginkgo, you know, working on these things. Now, uh, COVID came around and uh, now we're accelerating how we're thinking about using the beacons for um, COVID-19 efforts. And it's, uh, you know, th there's the antibody discovery piece, which is, which is great. And uh, we're excited about that. And we're also thinking, how can we screen in a, in a platform that's actually uh, going to enable production at reasonable or high levels of the, uh, the therapeutic antibody candidate um, and, and screen those in the beacon, right? Um, so sort of combining what they've done in antibody discovery and also what, what they've done in cell line development.
Great, excellent. Thank you, Narendra. So for anybody who's just joining us, we're talking about the Berkeley Lights Consortium that was started recently called the GPAD, and we're going to delve into the details of that very shortly. To give everybody a sense of what's happening in the world of COVID night right now, we have patients who are recovering and they have antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Those, uh, that plasma, that patient plasma is being sequenced. The Berkeley Lights hardware is being used to separate the B cells into different pens. You can see these pens behind uh, Eric Hobbs uh, uh, right now. Those pens, uh, each one would have a different B cell in it. They would then be cultured using the, the medium that uh, Yun Hyung has developed. And the medium uh, then pr allows the cells to, to be productive and to produce antibodies. Those antibodies can then be assayed against the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus and to see whether it neutralizes it. And then you can trace back which antibodies which cells were producing the antibodies that neutralized the virus. These cells can then be taken and passed over to a foundry like, uh, like uh, at Ginkgo that Narendra was talking about and put into Cho cells or other mammalian hosts for scale up. These can then be used as therapeutics against, uh, against COVID-19. Um, so this is kind of the workflow that we're seeing and we're probably, probably four to six months away from um, from these uh, antibodies being scaled up as, as therapeutics. Um, Eric, did I get everything right in my summary in terms of what's uh, what's going on? Yeah, pretty close there. I'm sure Jim would add uh, another step in there, which is uh, afterwards there's a sequencing and re-expression uh, by which, uh, by which you know, after post re-expression, there's some in, in vitro assays followed by some animal model studies, uh, which give you sufficient information to get into IND. Jim, did I get that approximately correct? <laughs> Yeah, there's a DNA step. Well, there's an RNA, DNA, yep. protein, assay, animal step in there. Yeah, but uh, those, have well, been, so, yeah. those have been expedited. I mean, they, they don't take that long these days. Yeah, so the step that I missed, of course, actually, and this is good good uh, for, for, for one of our other partners, which is Twist Bioscience, which I know is a partner of, of yours, Jim, which is uh, then you want to go back and you want to sequence which, which uh, antibody those cells are producing. Then you can now take those on, scale them up in a, in a Cho cell. Then you do animal studies, then human studies. Um, it's possible off the Berkeley Life to export and directly amplify the gene, and you do not have to commit yourself to right. synthesis. Um, we're still sort of working out the efficiency of that, I think. But, you know, an alternate way to do it is just to sequence the amplicon uh, and then synthesize it, which is most of what we've been doing. We do the synthesis with twist, but, but it's possible to just directly get the DNA copy of the genes right off the instrument. Got it. Okay, very interesting. And so, uh, Eric, then going back to the work that you did with, with uh, GenScript, uh, which is one of your partners in China. Um, can you give us a, a, a quick uh, overview of what happened then? Because, and, and this story about the mice being escorted across across China, because this was one of the first antibody uh, antibodies against COVID-19 that was found. Is that right? Yeah, that's, uh, to our understanding, uh, that's, 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 the, that's the story. And, you know, at a very high level, you know, the rapid, rapid discovery of antibodies in, in China was, of course, of, of national interest. And, and so uh, police escorted the eight mice across to GenScript and, and the same, a very similar protocol that we used uh, here uh, with, with Jim uh, at Vanderbilt uh, was to, of course, you know, take the mice, process the mice, put the cells in the system, uh, look for binding and blocking, binding, they were primarily binding assays, uh, and then export export the hits. And as, as Jim mentioned, there is a rapid re-expression protocol which Berkeley Lights will uh, provide, a, provide a, a high level kind of recipe for in the future uh, where you can go directly out of the, out of the Berkeley Lights system and, and re-express for, you know, certain, certain amounts of, of the things that, that uh, of the antibody which can be used for early, early functional testing. Um, and so, and so GenScript was really interesting uh, from a, from a first standpoint, but you know, we also asked ourselves, we said, you know, hey, it was at that point, I think Jim had reached out and, and, and we had been in discussions with Emery and, and Jim and also Erica uh, through all this time on, on how to do this, how to operate, you know, with, with human patients and how to run different assays or how to keep the cells alive. Uh, and as, as Jim mentioned, it all kind of came together. And, and the wonderful thing is, and, and, it's, and it's all still coming together because, you know, Erica has some very interesting stuff she just sent us. Um, 
And, and the thing that's really interesting about this group, about about GPAD, is is the following: is that you know we we were kind of we were having discussions at Berkeley Lights, and these discussions were through Keith Reininger, our CTO. We're we're kind of going out to into all of the members of of this community, and we're really asking ourselves really you know the the very important question. And the very important question was was you know is there a better way to respond to pandemics in the future? And, and so it's not like we didn't have warning about these things. I mean, you can talk to Jim, his TED talk. You can talk to Erica. Erica gives a, a wonderful presentation on these issues that are happening around the world. And, and, and what we realized is that, you know, these infectious diseases can pop up, you know, globally anywhere in the world at any time. Um, we can't predict them. Uh, you know, we may, there may be some higher risk areas, but, but they can pop up any time. And, and so the question was, you know, after they do pop up, and people do get sick, right? Some people do get better, luckily. That's the power of the human immune system. And, and the entire human immune repertoire in response to these diseases lives with those people, you know, in their blood, if they create this long-lived response that, that Onion was, was talking about. And so we asked ourselves, well, is there a way to tap into that? And so if we created this global consortium, could we develop the world's best workflows and if we had those workflows, the wonderful thing about the Berkeley Light system is you can run these workflows, you can run these workflows on these machines in an automated way anywhere in the world. So could that enable the fastest response, uh, that, the fastest response to, to these emerging pathogens? And we kind of scratched our head and we said, well, um, you know, hey, Erica, would you be in? Jim, what do you think? Would you like to join? And, and, and Anyang, would you like to be a part of this thing that we could, you know, I think Jim was talking about earlier. He said, hey, I got into antibodies because I realized I could I could make a therapy that could impact instead of 80 people or 40 people, you know, people global, right? But what if we could create a workflow that doesn't create just one antibody, but antibodies for all of these infectious diseases? Could we magnify the potential of this of this very intelligent group even 10, 100 times full? Well, that's that's actually pretty interesting, and why most of us are here working on this. Uh, and so we formed this consortium called the Global Emerging Pathogens for Antibody Discovery, uh, and we we launched into making these best workflows so they could run globally and and run uh, in in a distributed fashion uh, uh, around the world anytime. Fantastic. So the GPAD consortium, that's the Global Emerging Pathogen Antibody Discovery Consortium. So the goal of this consortium is that you will, as it grows, you will have these beacon instruments a global network of them all around the world so that wherever one of these nasty pathogens arises you can then immediately start to be sequencing the plasma from these patients from these recovering patients and immediately start to share that information with the rest of the global network and have this uh, antibody defense excuse me this antibody defense library ready to go is that right yeah, that's correct. And, 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 and the benefits are for the members, the members get access to the latest and greatest technology. And, and we're not asking members to share sequences or, or very secret things, uh, but, but they share a little and they get a lot and everybody gets access to the best workflows. Uh, and, and so Erica can have access to Anyang's media and, and workflows that, you know, Jim choose any, anything that Jim chooses to share with the team uh, can then go run at places like Ginkgo or, you know, hopefully in the future, uh, beacons which are deployed in centers for disease control around the world. And, and when we get to that point, actually, I think, I think we'll find that we'll have a much faster response. I mean, in this particular situation, you know, we, the people who had access to blood early on didn't potentially have access to the state-of-the-art technology that we're talking about today. And the people who had access to state-of-the-art technology didn't get access to blood until three months later. Well, three months in a pandemic is a long time. Uh, and, and that doesn't need to happen. We have the technology. Let's organize ourselves. To, and it's not like we didn't get warning. Barack Obama was, you know, presenting to, to the NIH. It was December 2nd, 2014. He said, in five years, maybe some will show up, right? And, and Gates uh, has a TED Talk from 2015. We all knew the infrastructure wasn't put in place, right? But now we have the capability to distribute this technology so we can have these rapid responses in the future. Great. And we, we were chatting about this over the weekend in preparation for this uh, for this call, Eric. And I asked you what I thought was a was a smart question. It was actually a stupid question. The, the question was, well, why if 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 you know we've got Ebola and all these other diseases out there, why 
why is it taking so long? Why don't we have good antibodies against these? And, uh, and, and you reminded me, you said, well, you need patients to recover and then sequence the patients. And we haven't got, thankfully, a lot of Ebola patients. Um, uh, and unfortunately, we do have a lot of COVID-19 patients that we can sequence the, the, the plasma from. Uh, Erica, I'd like to bring you in and, and kind of just reflect on that because you work on all these uh, viruses like Ebola and, and others. Uh, can, you t can you talk a little bit about that and, and, and finding plasma? And then can you talk about this global network and what excites you about the sure. consortium? Well, we have some of the antibodies against some of those diseases, but previously it was just slow and it was just hard and you'd have a lot of losses along the way. And so with improvements in technology, you can now find them instead of in months to years, in days to weeks. So I can show you a couple of visual examples, uh, sure. one from Lhasa and one that's Jim's from Marburg. So this is an antibody therapeutic that we saw the structures of against Lhasa virus. So the Lhasa glycoprotein trimers in the center, the white antibody is one that anchors the molecules together to block separation and fusion. This one blocks receptor binding. So by coupling antigen design, antibody discovery, and structural biology, you can design a complementary cocktail for treatment. And this one, this is Marburg virus glycoprotein, and this is an antibody that Jen discovered from a woman who had survived Marburg, came home quite ill. And so what you can do with this one, so this guy binds into the receptor binding site to block attachment to the new host cell. And what's great about the, that target is that of all the different viruses in the whole filovirus family, Ebola, Marburg, Sudan, Bundabujo, all these things that cause human disease, that receptor binding site is conserved and it's shared. And so there's an opportunity to not only target a key site that the virus can't do without, but to find the opportunity for something cross-reactive. And so when Jim is able to find a patient that survived one of these things and interrogate the complexity of that immune response, you can find individual molecules that have the activity that you want, and we can figure out exactly how they work and how you might combine pairs of them to make a complementary cocktail. And so that's what the Gates Foundation asked me to do for coronavirus, that a couple of years ago, we organized an international consortium to figure out why it was we didn't have a lot of good antibodies against Ebola virus yet, what information we were missing, what tools we were missing, how we could find them faster. And so they've asked me to organize a consortium called COVID. Coronavirus Immunotherapeutic Consortium. So there are at least 50 different groups around the world that are raising therapeutic antibodies for use against the coronaviruses. And the Gates Foundation wanted to make sure that they, a cocktail was found of sufficient potency that the cost of goods would be low enough and dose low enough that it was accessible to developing nations. And so they wanted to compare the different antibodies available side by side to figure out what would be a good product they could help make sure is available to the people that need it, and the body of academic information. So what's going to happen is that several hundred antibodies raised by these different universities and companies will come here and they'll all be blinded. So we don't know what samples will be what, I won't know what they're what, but the owners will know what their samples are. And they'll be run by side by side across different assays of binding, measuring binding constants, high resolution epitope binning, neutralization in pseudovirus and live virus systems, in vivo protection and structural biology to build a very broad, deep, multidisciplinary database so that as we build this, the information on the blinded set of antibodies will be available to understand what do antibodies against this virus do? What are their different activities by which they inactivate the virus or block entry? What might be complementary activities, complementary binding sites? And the owners of the antibodies will see where their candidates are in there. And so they'll know how they're stacking up and what's worth continued investment um, they'll have access to different kinds of data they may not already have, they can use for the IND filing. Then the Gates Foundation has an opportunity to make a, to develop a non-exclusive license to make sure that there's a cocktail that they can make available for medical workers, first responders, vulnerable people, and to mop up outbreak situations anywhere in the world, whether or not there's a, a market force there. Fantastic. Uh, Erica, we'll come back to this uh, consortium. It's very interesting. We'll come back to it in a second. Narendra, I know that you've got, a, you've got to run to another meeting. Can you give us a sense of your interest in this global consortium and why you think it's impactful? And then can you give us a sense of uh, the other work that you're doing at Ginkgo for the Foundry, particularly around, around uh, some of the plans for vaccines? And then if somebody wants to reach out and use the Ginkgo platform uh, in some project, what should they do? 
Uh, yeah, so maybe the, the last thing first, uh, you, you can read on our webpage, ginkgobioworks.com slash blog. There's a COVID-19 response at Ginkgo Bioworks uh, email. You can certainly reach out there. Uh, so um, uh, along the lines of what, er what Eric was describing, you know, we on March 17th, we sort of made $25 million available on our platform for therapeutics, diagnostics, and vaccine work related to COVID-19. And we were seeing a lot of folks who had identified antibodies um, by various methods, um, but they what they were lacking was some sort of functional assay, uh, a neutralization assay that Erica described. And then, you know, the COVID is going to do a lot more uh, than just that. But this seemed like a need. And so, you know, what at Ginkgo, you know, we've built different pieces that we can rapidly reconfigure to deploy uh, for different problems, different solutions. So we started brainstorming, how can we stand up uh, a, a binding and neutral, really neutralization assay, uh, where we would then uh, actually synthesize uh, different partners' antibodies and and then um, assay. So that's what's going on at at Ginkgo uh, right now, um, and and I'm sure the group will talk about the reagents involved for those assays and making sure when we screen, you know, are we really going to be screening um, things that will prove to be neutralizing in patients. Um, but, but I did want to say uh, one thing, and which is sort of longer term, uh, and this is from conversations with some folks in this group and as well as uh, other, other folks sort of around the world, uh, it, wouldn't it be great if we started doing some of this work ahead of time, um, uh, sort of what Eric was alluding to? Um, it, you know, we, we have technology now. We have, we have the beacon. There are some patients, right? And I, and I don't know the details about getting uh, those samples. Um, but could you then imagine uh, taking uh, good candidates from uh, the identified, right, and, and having uh, producer cell lines ready to go with these candidates already in? Now, we're seeing a lot of challenges where you know, something, uh, a potential antibiotic candidate, oh, this, this is great. How soon can you get it, you know, to produce for my clinical study at, at scale, right? You know, wait, three to four months. That's way too long. Can you do it faster? So uh, one thing sort of we're also interested in is uh, how can we work with, with folks like, like in this con consortium and, and put them into a, a platform, it could be a Cho cell line, it could be different platforms, uh, I think there's a lot to think about there, uh, so that you have these libraries ready to go. Uh, one thing I'm struck with is uh, if you look at some of the um, candidate therapeutics and vaccines that are more advanced, um, Veer uh, has a uh, therapeutic antibody that should go in the clinic, I think, in June. That's against SARS-CoV-1, right? So, so, you know, advanced. Uh, the Oxford vaccine that's getting a lot of press right now was was because their their vector had MERS in it, right? So, could you imagine doing this for a, the potential emerging pathogens? Which ones are the experts here can comment on? Which ones? Uh, but but we'd we'd be really excited about uh, uh, doing something like that. Um, for future pandemics, right? With the with then you identify using the the beacon very quickly, but you have these libraries set up. And Fantastic, you thank you, Narendra. I know that you have to go. I appreciate you taking the time to join us today, and we can post in the link that Narendra mentioned on the Ginkgo blog website and the email address. So if anybody wants to get in touch with Narendra about uh, either scaling up antibodies in mammalian cells or in vaccine antigen um, work, then please uh, please reach out to them. Thanks again, Narendra. So I want to remind everybody, Thank this you. is a live yeah. call. And if you have a question that you'd like to ask any of our panelists, then you can click the participate and share your audio visual. And you can type the question into the box and you can ask them live. Um, I want to go back to uh, also remind uh, a reminder that after this at 9 o'clock in about 15 minutes, we've got a half hour breakout session where you can chat with uh, our panelists individually about topics that you want to go a little bit deeper on. So Eric, I know, can join. Erica can join. And Hyun Hyun can join. Um, J Jim, are you able to stay for the breakout or do you have to go at night? No, I'm not going to be able to make it, but thank you. Okay, well, so we have uh, three breakout sessions that we uh, that we'll be uh, talking about, and uh, and Erica and, Fra and uh, Yun Yun, if you have um, uh, specific topics that you would like to talk about in those breakouts, then uh, then please be thinking about them, and we can uh, we can uh, we can share those with the audience as well. Um, so I I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Erica. You mentioned the work from the Gates Foundation, and and Jim and Erica, you both worked in Africa. 
this is uh, maybe a sensitive topic, but we've all seen the press about these uh, these these protests that are going on. The anti-vax movement has combined with the with the the anti-lockdown movement. You're seeing posters put up about Bill Gates uh, and 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 the vaccine movement. Uh, Erica, I just wanted to kind of uh, allow you to, to to comment on that. I I I'm, I'm, I don't want uh, necessarily this just to be a, a venting of frustration, but maybe we could come up and think about some solutions towards this because it must be very very painful for you as uh, both of you have worked in Africa the work that you're doing then to see this uh, absolute craziness that, that we're seeing now in this country well vaccines are the best bang for your public health buck um, but we're not going to have them for a while the we're we're going to be living with this and all other viruses until we have sufficient herd immunity one way or another to prevent unimpeded transmission okay and there's an easy way to get herd immunity and that's vaccination and there's a hard way to get herd immunity which is to wait for everyone to get infected so if you think about i don't know 330 million americans if you need 60 to 70 percent of them to be immune that's 200 million people that need to get infected and then get better um, and there will be a lot of losses along the way so that's the hard way to get herd immunity vaccines are the easy way but there are people that can't be vaccinated because they're babies, uh, they're pregnant, they have some other condition. There are people that won't have yet been vaccinated because even once a vaccine is discovered, it's gonna take some while to, to make it and deliver it and it won't be everywhere in the world all at the same time. And so need, there needs to be other ways of delivering immunity. You can make an antiviral antibody faster than you can make a vaccine because we fundamentally understand how an IgG works and how to scale it up and how to deliver it and what it's gonna do. And so I, I firmly believe we need multiple avenues of research and multiple different ways of protecting people. Jim, any thoughts? Well, to be honest, we've been so busy. I <laughs> stay off my phone and I don't look at any media. I think the, the political stuff is very pertinent to the social distancing discussion. So you have people's jobs versus safety. And I think that scientists cannot only answer economic problems. So I think that's a natural tension for politicians have to be there to address. But in terms of the business of making vaccines and antibodies and antivirals, politics is, is not really appropriate here. So I just try to stay out of that and put my head down and uh, come to work and, and do the development. And I think it doesn't contribute to our uh, our discussions about how to move forward on vaccines and antibodies. The um, the avoidance of vaccines is just uh, it's a social um, issue that we do need to address through education. But I think if there's good solutions for coronavirus, people are going to want them. I think that's a given. Agreed. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions. Casey Lipmeyer at Conagen. Will the winning antibody sequences and strains be shared for distributed manufacturing? I'm not sure whether this was in uh, regards to your comment, Erica, or just more globally for the consortium. But uh, Erica, do you want to take that one? So on a really practical level, the only way you're going to get 50 different companies to participate in a side-by-side -side, side -side analysis of their candidate molecules is if their intellectual property is protected. And so I don't have their sequences, so I can't share their sequences. It's up to them. And I'm sure many of them would be interested in doing that once that IP is protected. The goal and their focus right now is just to get those molecules available to get people protected as soon as possible. Got it. Eric, uh, any thoughts on the, on the in terms of the global consortium and the sharing of data? Um, I think, you know, sharing of data is, it's, is a really important question. And so in the consortium, we protect everybody's individual rights. Everybody has rights to their own data and gets to decide what they share with this community. Um, it's There's no sequences that are shared through the consortium um, because, because that is a very important aspect of why you know certain companies are making investments into into discovering these different antibodies um i think that uh i think that in the future you know once once ip is filed on these sequences uh, i would love to see these different sequences put into uh you know some of the wonderful structural biology forms that i've seen from erica's group and and you know, the 3d models or or the nano structures where we jump into virtual reality and we can go twist around and see actually how these things are functioning. I think that's I think that's actually a really important step, because 
I naively believe that you know a rich a rich solution space that we can find from you know through the Berkeley Lights device, uh, those solutions should be loaded up into the cloud. Uh, you know, I hope uh, all beacons that are placed around the world through this consortium are loaded. You know, the information is loaded into the cloud so that we can get those things in the hands of the structural biologists to think about. You know how these things are operating, how they're functioning. We can run the simulations and silico simulations in the future. We can make and design better antibodies in the future. I mean, it's not just uh, FC-based antibodies which are the solution. There's already companies working well beyond that with bi-specifics and multi-specific solutions, which start with the discovery of these of these basic antibodies from from humans or animals. And so, uh, I believe there is path to get very fast in the future. But the the person who's asking the question is absolutely right. When can when can access be unlocked to the information that we found so we can have a larger community participating. It's a good question. Eric, it looks like you got something. So, yeah. So what, while companies want to protect their therapeutic candidates until they're covered, researchers need tools, right? We need to be able to track the different antigens. We need to have positive and negative controls. We need to understand how the virus enters, how it buds, how it releases. And so the other part of what my lab is doing is making research tool antibodies. So we're making these in mice, so they're not gonna be therapeutic candidates, but we can make those sequences available. And so you can have, based on the antigens that we've made for structural biology, which are pretty dang good, we're immunizing those in mice, and then we'll make a panel of antibodies against the internal proteins, the external protein, and the sequences of those will be available, and you can just get that and use it in, for your research. Great, uh, great point. Um, just a reminder, this is a live Q&A, and if you have questions, you can type them into the question box there. And if you want to uh, come on and ask your question live, then just type your question into the question box and we can see uh, and, and click the uh, participate or the share your audio and you can come and ask that live. Um, uh, Anyang, I would like to bring you into the conversation again. Can you give us a sense of what's next in your research? What do you see down, down the road happening, either with coronaviruses or with other infectious diseases? And uh, particularly, you talked about this media that you created. And so I'm wondering, what other tools or technologies do you wish you had or do you see your lab developing over the next few months or years? I think you're on mute. We're also, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can, yeah, go ahead. One of the other things that we're working on in my lab is actually trying to use the plasma cells as um, a diagnostic tool. So one of the very interesting things is that the plasma cells come up at the time of infection or vaccination or in the bloodstream, and then it goes to wherever it needs to go. So we capitalize on the cells that are in the bloodstream at the time when you're sick. So if you come in and you have these symptoms and you don't know what you're sick with, for example, if it's coronavirus or if it's gonna be flu or if it's gonna be something else in the fall, one of the things that you can assay is sometimes people can get the PCR swabs, but um, sometimes they're harder, you know, we can't even find swabs these days in some places. So in those scenarios, one of the things that you can do is you can capitalize on the antibodies that are floating around in the blood when you're you're sick. And so we basically call, we created a new matrix. So the novel antibodies that are made by the what we call the ASCs or plasma blast that are circulating in the blood when you're sick, we collect those antibodies and we call that media, the media that's enriched with newly synthesized antibodies, and we interrogate that. And when we do, we separate that all from the plasma or the serum. And the serum and the plasma contains everything that you have historically, but the stuff that you have just in that specialized ASC population, that, that, that Mensa media, the media that's elaborated with newly synthesized antibodies, tell you what you're sick with. So if you interrogate those, you can actually um, potentially use it as a diagnostic tool. So we're trying to do that for COVID. So we're trying to figure out if certain antibodies that are made make you fall into a category where you're going to be critically ill versus those when that you may actually just survive and you'll do fine with the infection. So I think that's just some of the things that we're doing in our lab. But the other piece, I, I'm like Jim, I'm just an MD. Um, I don't really, um, that's my background um, in terms of what I bring to the table. And so when I was thinking about all these, you know, I survived through the 2009 influenza pandemic and took care of patients in the intensive care unit. I'm a pulmonary critical care trained physician. And so that's what I've done. And so like I've seen the recent papers on 
plasma that's protective. But what's really interesting in the recent paper that came out in JAMA about plasma that's protective, which is what we're trying to shoot for, trying to be recombinant monoclonal antibodies, is that I think that we want to use them prophylactically, and then we also want to think about using them therapeutically. And when we use them therapeutically, we may need to use them at a certain time because there's going to be a critical window where it's really important. And what we've also found with COVID is that there's a lot, this enormous inflammatory response that we're seeing, the cytokine storm, this microangiopathic uh, injuries that we're seeing basically in the patients, they clot like crazy. And a lot of that is probably related to the fact that they have this huge cytokine response or some inflammatory response. So I think using what they did in that recent paper was they used plasma in conjunction with steroids or methylprednisolone. And so we're going to need something like using it in a therapeutic case in a critically intensive, in the critical patients with some immunomodulator. So I think it's going to, we're going to be thinking about it in multiple ways to, to use this therapeutic that Erica, Jim, Jim, and Eric have all put together in terms of what we're finding here in these antibodies. Fantastic. Eric, we have a question that's coming from the audience for you, but before we do that, uh, if people are watching and they want to know how they can get involved, how they can join the GPAD consortium, what should they do? Um, so reach out to Berkeley Lights. If they want to join the GPAD consortium, we're happy to have discussions with them. Um, part of part of being a part of the GPAD uh, means, means having access to a Berkeley Lights tool because, because we want you to contribute back to the consortium. It's not okay to join and just take. Uh, you, you join and you give. Uh, that's part of the, the, the community uh, that, we're, that we want to build is the people who join with the purpose, with the purpose of giving and making something better. Uh, and so, and so working through our our either sales or, or marketing organization will be happy to to contact you uh, and 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 bring you on board as a member of GPAD. Great. Maybe we can paste a link there in the chat for anybody who wants to uh, to get in touch with Berkeley Lights. Um, and the question from Joanne Shatkin says: Is there a way that the beacon could be useful for evaluating safety of candidate therapeutics? Uh, that's a it's a really good question. I think it's a really hard question. I mean, uh, so again, I'm not an expert in this field, but uh, one thing I can tell you is that biology is insanely complex uh, that I've learned from my friends in, in this world. Um, and so to say that we could run a simple in vitro assay, which would be representative of a whole system, I think that would be far overstepping uh, the bounds. I, 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 that's not something I'm willing to state. Um, you know, if there were high level things, if you wanted to know if antibodies cross reacted to different proteins on different surfaces of different cells types, it is possible you could load different cell types into uh, into the beacon, and you could test for you know binding and cross reactivity to other other uh, other proteins on surfaces. But uh, you know, look, um, there's a reason why uh, after antibodies are discovered that they go through a re-expression and are tested in animals first uh, prior to going into humans, and that's and that's because we want to be safe. The world wants to be safe with the, with the drugs that we're making because. It's some very bad. I'll let Jim, uh, Jim or Erica, answer these questions. Or Anyang, right? Is is that you know these these therapeutic these therapies therapeutic antibodies that we find they can be used for good. They can also have some very bad side effects. And so we have to exercise caution and follow our protocols, our best known protocols for taking these things to market to ensure uh, the safety of of all patients. I mean, um, and you talk about vaccines. My goodness, Erica talked about it earlier. Two hundred million people vaccinated. Right. Well, we'd better make sure that's a safe uh, that's a safe protein that we're putting into a, into this these 200 million people, uh, and also that that protein is is you know modifying the immune system or interacting with the immune system in a way that it is creating the response that we need to provide protective immunity. And that's a that's a I like to call it the Goldilocks problem. Right. It's it has to be a strong enough protein to 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 elicit a memory memory response and and it can't be so weak that it doesn't uh, limit the memory response it's got to be right in the middle uh it's got to be safe it's got to be efficacious and so uh these are these are serious things that we're dealing with and so again um could you will there be in the future studies uh, organoids or multiple cell types yes you can do that um but um i do believe we need to follow our protocols uh through working through animal models erica anything you want to add or jim yeah, there's a couple of straightforward assays we're going to do on our beacon, which is to find out if the antibodies that we are making, do they 
prevent as well as enhance receptor binding? Do they prevent or enhance cleavage? Do they prevent or enhance fusion? And so you can look at those different activities and if it's something that enhances what you don't want the glycoprotein to do, that would be one that you would down select. Excellent. Um, Jim, any final thoughts? I'm, I'm pretty curious as to any positive things that you're seeing at, come from this pandemic. Certainly you've been talking about infectious diseases for a long time, talking about sequencing antibodies and the need for a global immune system. Um, give us some hope that, uh, that things are going to get better and that this isn't going to happen again. Well, I think the hope is this, everything we've talked about today actually works. So we um, just ran a campaign with samples we got March 14th, ran through uh, several thousand individual cells to coronavirus spike protein, identified individual clones that are potently neutralizing down to something like 10 nanograms per ml IC50, very potent antibodies. Uh, we know where they bind now all over the spike protein. There's 10 or 12 different ways to bind. And we've already uh, done animal studies. We have structures of some of them. We've already handed to four different partners for manufacturing. We've outsourced to a company, Lineco, who's making reagents uh, available to diagnostic companies and diagnostic kits for rapid antigen detection have already been configured with our antibodies on the device. And that's from a human sample that we, you know, we got March 14th. So this is not just smoke and mirrors that we're saying we can pull out a single cell and do something. The, the protocols are in place to do this stuff rapidly. So, you know, I think if we face another one, we'll be even faster. We'll know essentially what to do and how to do it, and we'll just execute. And uh, so, I don't know, four weeks to do the stuff that we just executed on is pretty quick. I think in future, you know, two or three, at some point there's like RNA synthesis and, you know, there's some limits in biology, but we're near to an optimized workflow, you know, on this instrument and the protocol. So I think that's a major benefit and outcome of what's just gone on in this pandemic. And we'll deploy it. And I, I think Eric is pointing to a future where it won't be one or two groups in the world that can do this. If we harden off these protocols, lots of groups could do it. Um, and therefore the, uh, the, it's already been mentioned that finding antibodies is a stochastic process. So if you had more groups with more samples taking uh, the same or similar approaches, you'd have more shots on goal and the stuff would not only happen fast, but be very effective. You'd find the rare clones that are the ones you really want. So I think it's been a major milestone in the, the field of antibody discovery that these techniques have been deployed live fire on a pandemic that we did not expect and they worked. Fantastic. Jim, I know that you have to go to another meeting. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really do appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me and, and all the people listening. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thanks uh, again, everybody.